Good morning, my fellow yogi travelers. I'm mighty glad to be alive today, and I hope you are too, as we continue to live, laugh, love, learn, linger, live the life we love. It's Friday, so it's PowerPoint day. Here's the beauty of initiation. Well, we have to face the shark, the, the dark, the shadow, the stuff that's dimly seen within us. Sometimes it appears in your dream as a dark figure of the same gender, indicating an upswell of information coming from your subconscious to the surface. And uh, it's different than our daylight personality. So sometimes uh, it can be uh, scary. Its rationale is not the same as every day. It's not irrational, but it's irrational because we don't understand its logic, but it has its own logic. So the key is to understand the relationship. Your ego, <clears throat> your unconscious mirrors back to your ego the same relationship your ego takes to the unconscious. So if you think that what's inside you is the festering swamp of insanity, who's gonna go into that? But if you thought of it as a repository of all virtues, like the Library of Congress of DNA is in you, different. Hmm? And what it does is enable you to turn your, your back on the light. Because when you face the light, you can be blinded by it, and it casts a shadow behind you where you don't see. But if you turn your back at, on the light, even though you haven't lost your faith, then the shadow is projected in front of you where you can keep an eye at. Because the psychic world is not just within your own skull, in here, as we would say it includes the field out there. So dreams, by symbolic analogy, they sometimes are communicating to you what's going on. Like the guy who has a dream that he's on a beach and cables get washed up on the shore. And he realizes what it is. He's in a connection to the mainland. So he's excited. He goes, tells his neighbor about it. But they think it's ugly and they want it thrown back into the sea. But he's able to convince them of its practical and functional effectiveness as a way of broadening the communication. They accept it. Look at this narcissism from Caligula. What a maniac. I've existed from the morning of the world, and I shall exist until the last star falls from the night. And although I've taken the form of Gaius Caligula, I am all men, as I am no man, and therefore I am God. Wow, the narcissistic grandiosity is insane. It's like a high chair tyrant. So this is one of the tough things to do. Yes, you have your own values, but to depose the tyranny of your own inner aestheticism that recognizes no values other than its own. That'll help you get along with people. Once upon a time I swore I had a heart, long before the world I knew tore it all apart. Once upon a time there was a part of me I shared, years before they took away the part of me that cared. Ah, we all get hurt and buffeted by society. So transition states, breakthroughs, ruptures in the status quo, that makes you go down. When you're forced to go down, you may not be at liberty when you choose to come up, just like in grieving. If you're not active in your grieving, you get depressed. But if you grieve, you have a little bit more choice about when you come up for air. Now, ritual initiation usually changes outer aspects of you to symbolize stuff. It's like when you go in the army, they shave your head. You've got to be a monk, they shave your head in the same way. They're trying to show you you're not the same and now you're about to go into the unknown. If you know where you're going, you're commuting. You learn that your parents are not your mentors, they're the high priest and priestess of another order. They can't worship in your temple. But when you find your mentor, you're in competition with your mentor. Not like a tennis game where you have somebody on the other side to make a uh, an adversary, but you're petitioning the same deity, sharing the same fantasy, right? praying in the same direction. They recognize equal fervor in you. And because they are a field of visibility for how it looks like when you're done, you get the eye of blessing from them. Now, we all have this rift that seems that we're separated from we, what we love, and there's this longing for union. But longing, by its very name, definition, nature, is a state of unfulfillment and sadness. So as long as you're longing for union, you're going to be sad. What's going to cover the gap? How are you going to go over the breach? Well, you have to learn to have union with the longing. Accept that that's the nature of the beast that we have this cosmic homesickness and we want to get back to that, whatever that is. Now, conversation is intercourse for the soul. They always keep telling people, keep talking, keep talking, keep talking. And whenever you talk about beauty, love breaks out. Unless you're so self-centered that everything in your conversation is about me, 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 right? Now, why do we pick the impossible lover? Because they keep the wound open. And through the wound, you learn a lot about compassion and living with grace, and how not to be afraid of your vulnerability and your fragility, and how delicate everybody is. 
Now, I love this quote from Emerson, Life's, everyone's life is a condition in hieroglyphic to the questions you would put, but it must be lived first as reality before it's apprehended as truth. Everyone's life condition is a solution in hieroglyphic to the questions one would put. It must be first lived as reality before it's apprehended as truth. Try to break down a person's life and understand what he like. You need the Rosetta Stone. But you live through it first, and then in hindsight, you look back, and then you realize what it is. So we all have to understand the aesthetic response to aesthesis to breathe in. When you look at the cosmos, there's a miracle, and you breathe in, you oh, is that fantastic. But then we see other things that happen that are cruel, inhuman. Let's say, like, abuse to a child, you breathe in also, oh, that's awful. The aesthetic response to breathe in the awesomeness or the awfulness. Now, all initiation takes you to understand yourself, the totality of all potential, just like a mandala is a psychological expression of the totality of yourself. Going deep within, you'll understand your own self mandala and all the different forces that pull you in different directions and if you have a center, then the center will hold. Find your king or your queen, the part of you that creates just order just because you exist. And don't be a tyrant or a weakling with the two shadow versions of being the ruler. You have an inner magus, a high priest or high priestess. They know, they inform you, they give you the true scoop. They steward entry and exit in and out of transformative space or they manipulate and deny that they use their knowledge for self-aggrandizement. And of course, the men, like Gando says, you shall not pass. And the women said, just a little vice, never fuck with a crown. Oh boy, all right. Now there's the warrior energy also that you get initiated into, your Rambo or your Wonder Woman, where you draw a boundary, you discipline yourself, you're skilled, you serve a transpersonal end that's worthy to be loyal to. And you don't get lost in the shadow versions of either being a sadist or a masochist. And then finally, you connect to your lover, the place of affiliation where you find creativity, fertility, joy, play. Unless you get lost in the shadow aspects of either being an addict or impotent and depressed. That's what I got to say today about the beauty of initiation. I hope that you got a clue or two. Have a great day. We'll see you next week.